Welcome to Renewable News. My name is Chris and this is your place to get up to date information about what is happening in Australia and well sometimes around the world about our progression to cleaner, greener forms of technology to help us and the environment. On today's show, South Australia breaks yet more records with solar panels, renewables come strong in 2018, Tesla Model 3 delivers start in Europe and guess who is a world leader in renewable installations? First up, Singapore-based Vena Energy has received the green light from state regulators to commence output to the grid from its 108 megawatt solar farm. Located 95 kilometers southeast of Adelaide, the massive 200 hectare site has more than 400,000 solar panels. The plant will produce clean energy from the sun with about 430 watt hours per year. That's like enough power for 82,600 homes and will save our planet more than 200,000 tonnes in CO2 annually compared to non-renewable sources. Of note, the Talon Bend solar farm, whilst rated at 108 megawatts, will only be allowed to export a maximum of 95 megawatts at any one time. This is a result of new rules laid down by the Australian energy market operator to ensure that facilities can deliver sufficient reactive power and not diminish the grid's reliability. That's like technical speak for the need for wind and solar to stabilise their output because, well, as you know, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. Apologies for that. This very point has actually been thrown at renewables for decades, but as you'll soon learn, hydro and water storage have long been used as batteries to hold potential energy and to make it available when it's required and at a consistent rate. The Venet Energy Group has said that it will actually install a significant amount of battery storage in the very near future. And from Tesla's latest earning call last week, I'm going to guess that this means another like Hornsdale battery. Massive. I'm excited to see that this solar farm will output to the Snowy Hydro for the next 22 years. So getting this green power, know that it's not just the water it's coming from, but also the sun. How great's that? The good news doesn't stop here. For the Snowy Hydro scheme, Gillies Parkinson of Renew Economy website observed that Snowy had planned to build a 28 megawatt diesel pika plant, but those plans were dropped last year in response to this and other solar plants coming online in the very near future. The outlook for South Australia is looking great with AMO noting that they're on target to generate the equivalent of 100% of its electricity needs from wind and solar by 2026. I'd like to see more of this from a sun-drenched country. Seeing the size of this solar farm is impressive but know that 200 hectares is equivalent to only like 2 square kilometres. And when I see a map of Australia and the potential for solar generation, especially compared to other developed countries, I wonder how many more green plants could we build and get rid of our coal and gas plants once and for all. Next, Cole Latimer from the Sydney Morning Herald shared the good news that in 2018, renewables contributed 20% of our power for Australia. This is great as a result of new wind and solar farms that were built and more households coming online with rooftop solar. Mr. Latimer noted that wind, solar, and hydro accounted for more than 21% of all electricity generated last year, and that this was up from 17% seen in 2017. A highlight from this story is that in December 2018, renewables actually accounted for more than 23% of all, all our electricity that we generated. That was enough to power 10.7 million homes. Other big wins for renewables are that wind power increased by 26% in 2018, after seeing very little growth in generation levels in 2017. Rooftop solar boomed once again, with a number of installations nearly doubling compared to 2017. And this comes on the back of a large, a number of large scale solar farms that started in 2018, generating more than 1000 megawatt hours of power for the first time. And the big takeaway I wanted to share with you and you share with your friends and family and any politicians, especially those who need a little bit of a lesson in energy generation. This 20% mix of power is the first time it has done so since the 1970s. Wait, what? Okay, bit of history for you folks. And trust me, this isn't going to be boring like any high school sort of lecture. No. 
You see, some brave politicians dreamt up a major project that would assist the potentially disastrous effects of droughts by diverting water from some of Australia's rivers like the Murray, the Murrumbidgee, the Snowy and the Tamut rivers. Now, it wasn't a popular decision at the time, as it was questioned not only for its impact on the environment, you know, like diverting rivers and so forth, but also whether or not massive amounts of energy could be obtained consistently from the project. But they marched forward with it anyway, and that by the end of the project, the Snowy Hydro Scheme would also provide an additional bonus of employing 100,000 people post-World War II. Construction started in October 1949 and over the course of 25 years, 16 major dams, 145 kilometers of interconnected tunnels and 80 kilometers of aqueducts produced seven power stations and that resulted by 1974 in 3,900 megawatts of power, which was contributing nearly 20% to our grid. Now, sadly, after this historic high, coal-fired power stations displace hydropower, with the Yulon power station coming online in the mid-70s, followed by Loyang A and then B in the 80s, and then uh, Orang and Bayswater power stations, and Queensland also added a few major coal generators in the 90s and the early 2000s. And in turn, our renewable mix got down to as low as 8.5% in the 2000s. But thankfully, and there is a silver lining here, folks, we are once again at over 20%. Now, take a look at your state and how it compared to others. Note how coal shift is uh, decreasing depending on which state you are, particularly like South Australia and Tasmania where they have none whatsoever and generate either wind and solar, or maybe even hydro. And if you have any doubts about where coal plants are going, check out this interactive map by Carbon Brief. See how there was like plants that I talked about earlier opening and wait for it. What's happening? The closing. Now, this is only this only goes from like 2000 to 2017, and I wish there was a more up-to-date version like this American one by Visual Capitalist, which shows power generation types. Note the dark grey circles, the coal plants. Now, watch what happens from 2007 to 2016. They're disappearing, particularly to the mid east. The blues, greens, and yellows are actually renewable forms of energy production, and it's encouraging to see their growth. Now, let's part this story here for a moment, and as I've got some more good news about Australia and how we're on track to meet our Paris climate targets, but first. Helping us get to cleaner forms of transport, Tesla announced that Model 3 deliveries have started in Europe, with customers picking them up from the Tilburg factory in the Netherlands. But not without issue. Now the story was picked up by Electric and they wrote that many Model 3 buyers were surprised to be quickly invited to take delivery of the vehicles in Belgium and the Netherlands. Now, as you may well know, delivery of a vehicle normally takes a while. They've got to unload them, prep them, all that jazz. So when Tesla reached out to them and said, hey, you can actually pick your cars up today, they found that they were actually turned back when they showed up which was obviously disappointing. As it turns out, Elon Musk was over there to helping oversee delivery. And on Twitter, he stated that, sorry, many unexpected challenges with cars coming through Zeeburg's first time. So cars will start moving out in volume tomorrow. And indeed they did. As you can see here from these happy snaps, owners were actually able to drive them away the very next day. So Elon's promise that the Model 3 will be uh, produced like to 3000 vehicles per week in the Europe. So lucky people, hey, Elon could do us a favor and just start delivering to the rest of the world with his right hand drive. That'd be muchly appreciated. And hey, staying with the Model 3 news for a moment, I'd like to say well done to Tesla on achieving a significant milestone that legacy car makers such as Nissan and Toyota should be studying. Clean Technica has found that Model 3 topped worldwide sales in 2018 by a significant margin. I mean, look at this graph. Outselling the nearest main brand competitor, the Nissan Leaf, Zachary Shanahan from the Clean Technica reported that Tesla's Model 3 achieved 55,000 sales above the Chinese brand BAC EC series, an extremely popular Chinese model. This means that the Model 3 gobbled up 7% of plug-in vehicle market, while the second and third only had 4%. So go Tesla. And in my final piece for today, the Australian National University, ANU, found that Australia is installing renewable power per person each year faster than any other country. 
Lead researcher Professor Andrew Blakers from ANU Research School of Electrical Engineering and Materials Engineering noted that Australia was installing renewable power per capita several times faster than the European, Japan, China and the United States. Wow, go us. He went to state that installation of renewables in Australia last year really ramped up compared to these other major economies and that we, they expect the trend to continue this year and beyond. This story was thankfully picked up by major publications, notably because the, uh, due to our lack of federal direction on the Paris Agreement emission reduction targets. And you noted that if we keep going like we are, we'll, we'll arrive more than five years early of the 2030 deadline. And oh wait, it gets better. They anticipate that Australia is on track for 100% renewable energy production by 2032. And, and I swear I didn't cherry pick this little tidbit up because I might tie in beautifully with the previous stories about how we're going uh, so far with renewable technology now and how our politicians are sometimes a little out of touch about power generation. Dr. Matthew Stock, the co-researcher on this paper with ANU, said the net cost of achieving 2030 carbon emissions targets, said in the Paris Agreement, would be zero because the more expensive forms of energy production, aka fossil fuels, fossil fuels, were being replaced by cheaper renewables. To quote Dr. Stocks, the price of electricity from large-scale solar PV and wind farms in Australia is currently $50 per megawatt hour and steadily falling. This is below the cost of electricity from existing gas-fired power stations and is also below the cost of new build gas and coal power stations. We anticipate that this will continue into the future provided that energy policies is not actively hindering development. So, it's disappointing to see that some members of parliament thinking that coal and gas are the answer, saying that they're cheaper and won't cause blackouts. But as I detailed in last week's episode, that that wasn't the case. Rather, it's actually due to coal fire stations withdrawing supply due to hot weather. And the take home story for everyone is that renewables are cheaper to build and supply to us with cheap, sustainable power that is kind on the environment. And why is that? Because once you set them up, there's basically very little ongoing cost. But I diverge. The ANU paper stated that Storage technology like pumped hydro and batteries mean the deathbed of Australia's coal power stations that have become too old and unreliable, and that the transition to a modern renewable energy system can improve grid stability. Good news indeed, and a great way to end this week's roundup. As always, links and supporting articles are found below. Hey, and if you've enjoyed this video, consider subscribing or maybe just giving it a thumbs up and share it on your socials. That'd be muchly appreciated. It supports the channel and enables me to keep going with making videos like this. If you have any questions or comments, please drop them down below. I'll be sure to answer them. And hey, if you do nothing, be kind to the environment.